Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. She came in uh, to this room as she was working on translation uh, to another room where her husband was sitting down with some people. She she said, can you guys tell me what is a hamburger? What is a hamburger? We had no idea what a hamburger is. And they, uh, after a discussion, they decided it was some sort of coat. Ah, So Mm -hmm. she went back, started working on it. And of course, remember, that was before computers. So it's all handwritten or typed. Uh, And then in about 10 minutes, she walked in with like a a really grim look. And she said, he ate it. (laughs) 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 So you just never know. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast. We're excited to have Dr. Olga Lukmanova with us today. Welcome. Thank you for joining us, Olga. Thank you for having me here. We invited... Olga to join us because we are really interested in how she teaches the seven authors that we have here archived at the Wade Center in her university where she lives. Could you where tell is us- that, Crystal? <laughs> Why don't you tell us, Olga, the name of your university? Okay. Would you like the Russian accent with it, too? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Russian name is Nizhegorodsky Linguistichesky Universitet imeni Dobralubova, which is very long uh, and very complicated. So in English, it's Nizhny Novgorod Linguistics University, which is in Nizhny Novgorod, Russia. Okay. And tell us what led you to incorporate some of our seven authors into your curriculum. Well, they're just immensely good, aren't they? Uh, yes. They have a great way of putting uh, very important, very insightful things, and they are outstanding in their capacity of writing in English. Mm. Right, because your specialty, you got a PhD in English literature from the same university. That is correct. So you are teaching all these authors in the, the original English, right? That's right. I teach American English, which is, may seem a little ironic because there are no Americans <laughs> amongst the uh, Wade authors. But uh, uh, I think English just works really well and they're so good. Uh, in Mm. what they say and how they say it, that when you teach quality English, I think they're just brilliant. Well, are you ever able to get into conversations about their religious faith in the classroom? Uh, Not very often, but sometimes. Uh, For instance, when we talk about the law of human nature uh, by C.S. Lewis, I mean, he clearly makes a point uh, about an objective a morality and objective truth. And that challenges a lot of young people's view on how morality is. And uh, it very quickly comes to why he um, poses this uh, worldview. So there is some discussion sometimes. You told us the other night that was one of the first things you read by Lewis, our, our authors. Could you give us a quick um, magazine article called From Communist to Christian? Could you talk a little bit about <laughs> how your personal background led to where you are today? Sure. Uh, I was uh, raised in a very normal Russian family. Uh, my father, my mom, my everybody was a communist, and I was a communist, and I was a maybe naive, but a very sincere communist. And um, when in 1991 uh, the Soviet Union ceased to exist, and the whole morality and guidance of the Communist Party collapsed, I was left with nothing really to believe in, and my morality kind of crashed. Uh, at about the same time, somebody gave me C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity as a gift. Um, and I read mm. the first chapter, and I thought, hmm, that actually makes sense. Um, that's really, really interesting. It does prove something about morality. And then I put the book back into its shelf. But then later, uh, when I was encountered with the truth um, of uh, an existential necessity uh, of there being a God, because otherwise the universe just didn't make sense. Um, I think I remembered that uh, that reading of the law of human nature, and I was able to work out that with God, morality actually had a solid foundation. Mm-hmm. And that was definitely one of the stepping stones. Do you think that when communism fell in along with the Soviet Union, was there a type of religious vacuum where Christianity had a chance to plant numerous seeds in fertile soil? 
Most definitely. Uh, that's a very accurate way of describing it, I think, uh, a religious, spiritual, existential vacuum. And uh, the Christians in uh, the West, including the United States, had been praying, I know, for, for mm. years and decades in some cases about uh, the awakening and the changes in the Soviet Union, and they were ready um, to, to come in, and that's what, what happened. And many, many churches were founded. Uh, many, many churches that had existed before were finally out in the open. They were allowed to function openly. A lot of mm. Russian Orthodox churches were res restored, and many, many new uh, evangelical churches were planted by missionaries. Mm. <laughs> and I understand, if I remember correctly, that it was um, an organization sponsored by InterVarsity through which you came to Christ. That is, is correct. How did that happen? Well, in 1992, I was uh, just graduating from my university. I was already hired by my university to start teaching in the fall, but I had basically nothing to do for the summer. And we had an InterVarsity global project from here, from Wheaton, Illinois, um, that came to my city. And I was invited to be a part of it. I had nothing better to do, so I joined. And mm. I attended some Bible studies and worship sessions. Didn't believe any of it mm. at all. But um, after the project was over, again, I was just compelled by the intellectual necessity to acknowledge that there was God. Mm. Mm. Reminds me of Charles Williams' comment that the staff work of the omnipotence never ceases to impress me. <laughs> here, the Wheaton mm. students went over in the 90s to Russia, and now here you are back here, uh, a, a leading proponent of our Wade authors here at <laughs> Wheaton. One of the things that you have mentioned is George MacDonald's effectiveness among the Russian people. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, I think because George MacDonald has a very clear way of stating very insightful, deep truths about, first of all, the fatherhood of God and mm. his immense love, which uh, mm. contradicts a lot of things that we maybe learned about both fathers and God. Uh, and nothing is too big or too small for his love. And he, I think, mm -hmm. um, just drips with God, who is love. And he always tells us that if we don't, um, if we find ourselves unable to love God, it's probably uh, because our God is the kind of God that is not worth loving. Mm -hmm. Because the real thing is love, and you can't help mm -hmm. yourself. Mm. I tell a story from Harry Emerson uh, Fosdick, the preacher, a heckler said, I don't believe in God. And he said, tell me about this God you don't believe in. Chances are I don't believe in him either. You, mm. That's the kind of thing mm -hmm. you would that's get right. out of. That sounds uh, very much like George MacDonald in one yeah. of his books. Mm. Right. <laughs> so has antagonism towards Christianity in the Soviet Union entirely dissipated, or is there t still tension after so many years of the marginalization of Christian faith? Uh, I think in Russia, we have to differentiate between the Russian Orthodox Church mm -hmm. uh, and the evangelical churches and other churches. Uh, I might be generalizing sweepingly, and uh, if I'm wrong, I'll be happy to be corrected. But uh, much of uh, what people think is Christian faith, um, or a lot of people in Russia who believe they're Christians, um, do so only because they're Russians or they're born in Russia or they go mm -hmm. uh, to the Russian Orthodox Church twice a year, I don't know, or in times of crisis. Um, so as there is no felt opposition to Christianity as a faith because it's so much a part of uh, Russia's heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, Ethnicity, does, even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of one of uh, David's students. He asked her, are you a Christian? And she said, well, of course, I'm Italian. That's precisely it. Uh, and a lot of the people, I mean, sometimes because of what I teach, and I teach, for example, a class in American values and beliefs, and how can you talk about values and beliefs without talking about a worldview? Mm -hmm. So we talk about worldview, and, and I invite students to identify what it is that they believe in. And sometimes people say, well, I'm a Christian, but they have never read the Bible. They have never really been to church. Because, again, in modern Russia, even though there's a movement towards, um, you know, having the liturgy in Russian, uh, there is a push towards that. But uh, the most of the 
services are done in Church Slavonic, and a lot of people don't understand mm. what's going oh. on. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, especially if you don't read the Bible, you will be hard put to understand what's happening. So a lot of the people identify themselves as Christians just because that's that's what you do. Uh, more and more people, when pushed, uh, realize that's not the case. And I remember one of my students in the end of the year said, well, thank you. I understand I'm not a Christian now. Because, uh, because I, I think mm -hmm. I said something to the effect, it's a little dangerous to think you're a Christian if you're not one. Mm -hmm. So she was not a Christian by the end of the year, and that was a step forward. Mm. And was it through reading any of the texts that we have here at the Wade? Well, uh, I mean, I do uh, ask students to read The Law of Human Nature. This is part of our curriculum. Yeah. Um, before that, I asked them to write an essay uh, answering two questions. Is there such a thing as the real right and real wrong? Or are some values better than others? Mm. And they have to try to reason their way mm, through those answers. Uh, and then I present C.S. Lewis's argument and we'll look at it as argument. So hopefully that's an influence. And then we um, read uh, an excerpt from Out of the Silent Planet um, when uh, Ransom translates Western speech. And this is just a, a fantastic exercise in political correctness, um, mm. I think. And the students are encouraged to think whether they really understand. Um, and again, I hope I'm not stepping on any toes here, but um, in I was in the States in 1999 um, in the spring when um, America was bombing Kosovo. Mm. Uh, and there was a school shooting on the same day. And I was traveling uh, to my place of work uh, on that day. And on the radio, uh, the announcer said, 12 Americans died today about the school shooting. And in the next sentence, 70 civilian casualties in Kosovo. Mm -hmm. And I quote this example to my students as to demonstrate, do you hear what uh, people mm -hmm. are saying. Do you understand what's happening? And I think this uh, text by C.S. Lewis is a fantastic exercise in that respect. Mm -hmm. I had the strange experience. I was reading uh, Lewis and Dostoevsky together in college. Mm. I remember the, the very opening. He says, we've all overheard a quarrel. Lewis immediately hooks you. He doesn't spend a lot of time on preliminaries. But I was also reading Brothers Karamazov, and one of the brothers says, Without, without, if there is no God, all things are permissible. And so there's a really interesting synchronicity in my reading in terms of having certain ideas reinforced. Mm -hmm. Do people still read Dostoevsky uh, in Russia? Very much, yes. He's part of the school curriculum. Um, yeah, people read him because they love him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you said last night they also read Chesterton. <gasps> yes, Chesterton is very well known and very well loved. <laughs> and why do you think that is? Well, because he's just fun, isn't he? He's mm. enormous fun. Father Brown is just the sweetest thing. Um, and uh, he, uh, his writing is very impressionistic, I think, and very, very colorful. Um, and uh, yeah, his stories about, um, well, about Father Brown, uh, they're shorter, so they're a little more manageable for even for people who are not believers. Uh, and again, they're just really well written, really well translated, and they make you think they're not shallow. Mm. Is he hard to translate because he's so aphoristic and often the wit turns on the meaning of a word? I imagine he would be. Uh, I'm really thankful for our amazing, great translators, people like Natalia Trauberg, who uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s visited here at the Wade Center uh, at, at Wheaton College, and she translated many of Boathouse. I don't know how one does that. Oh, to translate no kidding. P. G. Really uh, and Chesterton. And I also need to remind everybody that they worked without the internet. I mean, I remember right. George, uh, <laughs> translating uh, somebody like um, Evelyn Underhill or George MacDonald. You collect a small library on... Uh, uh, you know, Victorian poets or, uh, you know, ancient authors because you have to hunt down every little uh, reference. Uh, and I have no idea how the translators of old did this without uh, the Internet. Uh, no I, kudos to them. I don't know. They're just great. <laughs> Speaking of translation, our listeners will be interested to know that Olga herself has translated over 60 works from English into Russian, many of them very important works by Christians, such as John Stott's Basic Christianity and Knowing God by J.I. Packer, numerous texts. Was there 
one that was especially difficult for you or on the other end of things, was there one that was just pure joy to translate? Well, the the minute you said especially difficult, <laughs> I remembered Watchman Nee, What Shall This Man Do? Oh. Uh, and that was a translation of a translation because right. it was only available to us in English. And I remember those long paragraphs, which is a sentence which turns into a paragraph. And uh, forgive me, hacking through that paragraph was a job and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But I remember the challenge because you have to, um, every translation uh, project is, uh, I think it's Dorothy Sayers who said, you know, doing the right translate, doing mm-hmm. a good translation is a matter of making the right sacrifices. And you have mm-hmm. to decide which sacrifices you're going to make. And I always think about making the material, especially difficult theological material, more readable, not more sim- not more simplistic, not simplified, but more readable, breathable sentences so that people don't stumble over language. So the paragraphs had to be mm. chopped up into more manageable sentences. But it was a spiritual workout. It was a very mm. deep spiritual book. And I remember growing, you know how the physical sense of growing as you work. Mm. Um, as for delight, well, uh, I will never, uh, one of the, mm, one of the translations I'm most proud of is Fantastic by George MacDonald. Huh. It was both difficult and fun because uh, the book contains a lot of poetry. I don't know if anybody has translated any poetry. I always tell my students it's like moving bricks. Mm. Basically, you <laughs> sit down uh-huh. and you start playing with words and moving them this way and that way and using rhyme dictionaries and thinking about it and walking about. And sometimes it's sen- uh, a sentence would just not cooperate. And sometimes a whole, a whole poem just would come alive. So... Uh, And then uh, I remember reading The Golden Sequence, for instance, by Evelyn Underhill. And I immediately thought, okay, this has to come out into Russian. And it was difficult, but just purely delightful. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with theological concepts like grace or atonement? How would you, would there be an equivalent word or do you have to use a whole phrase to do justice to those kinds of theological abstractions? Well, we do have a long theological tradition yes. right, in Russia, right. which I mean, has its own <laughs> terminology. <laughs> Eastern Orthodoxy preceded both Roman Catholicism yeah, and Protestantism. I had a uh, colleague who's Eastern Orthodox. He resented American missionaries coming over to Russia. He says, we don't send missionaries to America. Why are you sending us? Mm-hmm. He felt that they were a Christian nation and they didn't need to be evangelized. There are many opinions about that, and there is an opinion that America needs to be re-evangelized all over again. Right. Yeah, that, that was <laughs> again, his opinion. That's up that for debate, I think. But, uh, sorry, I, I forgot what question I'm answering. I was asking about, <laughs> the, if you run into a word like atonement right. in Lewis, is mm. there an easy equivalent, or do you have to? Uh, there are proper equivalents that are, you know, dictionary entries that you just know. There are oh, certain okay. things you just know. Okay. There's a word for grace, there's a word for atonement. Um, recently, in the last... 10 or 15 years, the Russian Bible Society has produced um, new translations of the Bible, and they've tried something else instead of grace. And Mm. we, many of us agree that does not work. (laughs) They should go back to the original concept because it's a very specific, uh, very uh, content-rich concept that you cannot substitute with by the word joy or, you know, kindness. It's not kindness. It's grace. It's something else. But recently I was translating something for um, the Messianic Christian community, and the author was making... uh, distinction between atonement and redemption. And in Russian, both of these words are translated the same way. So there I had uh, to do some acrobatics mm, and mm, mm. explanations. But mm. Chris and I were just talking about, we talk about good and evil, but then we say, oh, I went and got some dry goods versus I'm going to give that student a good talking to. And it would be very strange to try to explain to someone whose first language wasn't English why that same word keeps showing up in so many different contexts. Well, I think all languages have the same phenomenon, yeah, so, yeah. don't they? Uh, and as again, um, I teach translation and interpretation among other things, and it's one of those, you know, it's ABCs of translation. You know, how do you deal with polysemantic words? Mm-hmm. Well, 
I know you value the work of Dorothy Sayers, and she spent a lot of time, as you've alluded to, thinking about the issue of translation, since she translated Dante into English, trying to preserve the poetry, but preserve his meaning. But she also encountered another problem um, dealing with the Christian message insofar as people start idolizing certain words. So they um, freeze their theological thinking into certain linguistic paradigms. And she got into incredible trouble when she didn't use King James English in her Man Born to be King plays, even though King James was one translation. But people start thinking that the word itself, the signifier, is as important as what it's signifying. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that happens sometimes. I mean, we have the synodal translation of uh, the Bible, which is the most acceptable in Russia. Uh, and this is something that everybody has. Uh, you know, you, you can bring in new translations. I don't think it has been sanctified so much, but this is the translation everybody's used to. Even though some of the paragraphs are oh, phrased in such a way it's a little hard to understand. Not as hard as King James English, but, you know, fairly hard. So new translations are more than welcome. Uh, sometimes older people or more traditional Christians might have a hard time with the new phrasing, but you, you have to do it. I mean, whatever mm -hmm. the resistance, don't you? I mean, you have to mm -hmm. find fresh forms. And that's why I right. find um, Sayers' work so refreshing. And George MacDonald himself, I think he s sneaked in um, a, few, a, few, a few things that, for example, instead of saying the beauty of holiness, right? He gives us an image of the fire of roses, mm -hmm. uh, refreshing mm -hmm. the phrase mm -hmm. and uh, giving it new meaning and new fragrance, if you wish, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm. I had elders in my church when I was growing up, when they were praying, they would say, we pray that we can follow thee and that we could find thou. And they had the idea that King James English was just intrinsically more spiritual Sacred. than yes. contemporary English. I think Sayers must have ran into that same problem. Right. But I think it's our uh, almost call. Uh, I think it's our duty as Christians to be relevant to our generation, to uh, yes. listen to the culture, to listen to what people are saying, how they're thinking, and to uh, carry the message, that, the, the same message, mm -hmm. but in the vernacular of the current generation, whatever it happens to be, without losing the truth. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost a duty. Yeah. Oh, I, w I would agree. I would agree, too. I had a professor of languages when I was in grad school who said things that you don't say this anymore. I want listeners to know that I do not approve of this comment. But he said, translations are like wives. If they're beautiful, they're not faithful. And if they're faithful, they're not beautiful. Which is not a very politically correct thing to say. Mm. <laughs> uh, but do Which you know it illuminates what we're talking about, that so much of our language is embedded in certain cultural values, that he was reflecting his, the sexism of the time in which right. he was educated right. and thinks nothing about what now we would consider an offensive metaphor. So we constantly have to be reevaluating how our language itself becomes corrupted by cultural values. Right. But I think I, you can understand his point. I had to do some Anglo-Saxon translating in uh, grad school. And Lewis said, all translation is interpretation. And you constantly said, am I going to make this a little smoother in English or am I going to stay very close to the meaning of the original? Mm -hmm. I suppose you face that in every sentence of every page. All the time. And you're absolutely correct. Every translation is interpretation. And I have to tell my students, uh, I mean, there are different schools of translation. Uh, there are different philosophies and approaches to translations. And uh, there have been times when Shakespeare in Russia was translated uh, syllable for syllable, equisyllabic translation. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you have the English word, the average length of an English word is 1.2 syllables. The average length of a Russian word is 3.4 syllables. Mm -hmm. How do you do mm -hmm. an equisyllabic uh, yeah. translation of Shakespeare without <laughs> butchering Shakespeare? And that's exactly what happened. So uh, what, do you, what are you going to do? Are you going to be a slave to the form? Are you going to be uh, faithful to the meaning? It's very, very difficult. And you have to make a decision uh, almost each, t each time. Uh, and it, it seems like it's impossible uh, and of course, there's going to be interpretation. Uh, 
each mer- each word carries a an, a fountain of meanings mm-hmm. for each one of us and its whole etymological history mm-hmm. too mm-hmm. so That's do you right. honor the etymology mm-hmm. of what it meant 100 years ago or do you just think of what it means at the moment it's being used it's very difficult and of course when uh, when george macdonald wrote uh, the word rose he may have had certain association with the word rose i translate the word rose with rosa which is the proper you know i have very different associations and my readers would have something else macdonald had no problem with that he said of course you're going to read something different from what i wrote that's mm. part of writing that's part of depth mm. and our russian scholars have to agree but um my personal philosophy of translation is i have to say well if george mcdonald were writing in russian how would he say that um of course it's always a judgment call and there's always Mm. courage involved in Mm. translation so but yeah it's always the good translation is the matter of making the right sacrifices each Mm. time Mm. you mentioned shakespeare and one of my favorite stories was about one of the many foul copies of hamlet because people would perform the plays and then try to reproduce it to sell to others because Shakespeare never published his plays. He was just writing for the stage. And so there's one copy of Hamlet that says, to be or not to be. Yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. It just doesn't quite. Have you seen the Black Adder sketch with Hugh Laurie and the Black Adder about this? Uh, he, no. Their conversation about uh, to be or not to be. It's hysterical. Watch. Oh, okay. Uh, it's really, really funny. <laughs> uh, but it also reminds me, forgive me for interrupting you, um, of uh, uh, there's a book about Tolkien translations in Russian, uh, mm. into Russian. And I did a whole lecture about Tolkien in, in, in Russia uh, here at the Wade Center about five years years ago and it, it's actually really really funny because there exist many translations and there are fans of each one of them and a very famous example is the phrase I think like Boromir side or something and one translation says Boromir side and then the other translation would say Boromir looked at her and sighed. Then Boromir looked around, you know, wiped his brow and sighed. I'm exaggerating a little bit. um, But uh, they actually rated the translations uh, for accuracy, uh, for being poetic, for being faithful. So uh, for how you translate names, which is a whole other topic, how do you translate Tolkien names? Uh, And Mm. uh, it's, again, each of the translations has its own following. And there's like a battle of translations. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, it's a judgment call. And everybody, uh, you know, uh, sort of defends his or her own theory and favorite mm-hmm. uh, approach. There's an incident with Lewis. He dedicated one of his books to f- some ladies at Wantage. And Wantage is a city near Oxford where there was a uh, Anglican uh, uh, convent. And the French translator th- translated it for some wanton ladies. <laughs> oh, <that's... laughs> wow. A little trouble with that. Yeah. Well, Natalia Traberg herself, uh, in some of her later books, uh, she sort of laughingly uh, said, you know, told the story of how she was translating a book. And again, before the internet, I mean, you just kind of you use the dictionaries and you know the the younger you are the more audacious you are the more mm. you think you know everything and, and i remember some of my own bloopers with shame but she she talked about um crepes you know the, the pancakes the thin mm-hmm. pancakes and she had no idea what crepes were and it sounded to her kind of like crepe de chine you know the fabric uh, so oh. she just went ahead and translated the crepe de chine <laughs> yeah. um, and she sort of laughingly talked about this later and then the more recent um uh, a story, well, not, not the more recent, uh, but the more recently published, is, uh, I don't know if you know um, Astrid Lindgren, uh, the Swedish author. Mm. Uh, her mm-hmm. book's about Carlson, who lives on the roof, uh, extremely popular in Russian. And she was the translator. Uh, this is uh, uh, Mrs. Lumgina was the translator for that. And she came in uh, to this room, as she was working on translation, uh, to another room where her husband was sitting down with some people. He sa- she, she said, can you guys tell me what is a hamburger what is a hamburger? Oh. We had no idea what a hamburger is. And they, uh, after a discussion, they decided it was some t- sort of coat. Ah. So mm. she went back, started working on it. And of course, remember, that was before computers. So it's all right. handwritten or typed. Uh, and then in about 10 minutes, she walked in with like a, a really grim look. And she said, he ate it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so you just never know. I'm really grateful for the internet. Let's just put it this way. Mm. <laughs> were you saying last night that Tolkien was, there was no authorized translation, so people were translating just handwritten page after page of their mm -hmm. own translations, mm -hmm. waiting for it to be authorized and printed. It's yeah, and about... they were done secretly, right? Yes. Yes. Mm hmm there's, again, there are books written about this, including books in English, so I think it's fairly easy to trace the history of Tolkien translations wow. um, yeah. in Russia in English. Mm -hmm. So even though he doesn't have explicit Christian allusions in his texts, he was still considered subversive by the Soviet government? Natalia Trauberg herself um, said that when they got the books, and I don't really remember how they got hold of the books, uh, it was like a breath of fresh air. Um, that they couldn't, you know, they just couldn't believe their mm -hmm. luck, you know, that they were reading something like this. And uh, when you love something, uh, if you are a translator or a teacher, you itch to get it out to other people. And mm -hmm. I think that's what happened. You just kind of, you have to uh, share it with other people. It was so good. Again, I remember my own first encounter with Tolkien, and it was. Uh, you, you just kind of shake with anticipation. You can't believe this freshness, this wonderful world is all around you. It's, so I can easily believe that they just they didn't wait. They just had to mm -hmm. start, start working. Well, there's a lot of jokes that even English readers don't get. Uh, the Hobbit's one place is called Mickle Delving, and Mickle means much and delving, much digging. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the names of places, there's a, there's a little hidden joke there. Mm -hmm. uh, Rivendell is literally a cleft in the mountains, but people don't realize the name is describing the, the, uh, the landscape or the geography. Would you even try to tackle that kind of thing in a people Russian translation? People do. People do. And that's the whole point of rating the translations, you know, right, according right. to how mm -hmm. the names are rendered, how faithfully, or, and there's the, or an article, or a book that tackles all of this, again, in great detail. It's published in English. I can't remember the name huh. right now, uh, but I think it's called Tolkien uh, in the Russian's eyes. I could be wrong, hmm. Hmm. but uh, and it's amazing because, for example, baggings, right? Baggings. Mm -hmm. You have an image of a bag, uh, bag end, but that's kind of like cul de sac, right. you know. Right. So there's that. Uh, and cul de sac, sac, of course, is also a bag. So there's that. So uh, baggins. How do you do baggins? Do you do baggins? which some people do biggins, you know, the Russian mm -hmm. biggins. We, and you lose, it, it sounds English, it mm. sounds, you know, cool and foreign, but it loses any associations. Or do you do sumkins? Sumka is just a regular bag. It could be like a bag that you take shopping. But that's not what you want. You don't want something as prosaic for the hobbits. So my favorite translation, and please forgive me if anybody is offended by, by this <laughs> being my favorite, is torbins. Uh, it comes from the word torba, which is a slightly older Russian. And a torba is something that you might carry when you travel. Um, so I just think it's beautiful mm. because it preserves the Englishness of it, uh, gives you the old fairy taleish kind of feeling, and uh, preserves the association. It's great, mm. I think. Also, Rivendell, you were saying. I think uh, this translation is brilliant uh, in translating Rivendell as Razdol, because Razdol gives a, a, a sense of uh, a meadow. Uh, something wide space, you know, something beautiful and free and beautiful. But also Raz is, uh, has a connotation of split. Hmm. Amazingly, hmm. right? You have to be a, you, well, you have to be a linguist mm -hmm. who's willing to dig. Uh, Mikkel, right. <laughs> Mikkel yeah, Delving, Mikkel. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, and to actually think it's really difficult to come up with this. And uh, these are translation geniuses, I think, people who come up, came up with this. I'm still baffled by the fact that Tolkien translations would be suppressed before the fall of the Soviet Union because he baptizes people imag people's imagination, to borrow Lewis's term about mm -hmm. MacDonald, insofar as he just establishes that there is this clear battle between good and evil. But it seems to me that that's consonant with mm -hmm. the view of the Soviet state. Communism is good, capitalism is evil, and we're in this um, sometimes literal uh, <clears throat> antagonism where there might be this iron curtain between us, but 
what is your theory as to why Tolkien would seem so um, or need to be suppressed? I really, really don't know uh, because um, I think he fairly uh, he came. I don't remember the exact dates, but I think they got hold of him in the seventies, which was the period of stagnation uh, in the Soviet Union. Mm. It and I don't know. I think one should go back to Natalia Trauberg's uh, mem- memoirs and kind of look back mm. to what happened. But it could be just the whole f- uh, sense of just freedom and freedom and this massive. A sweep of history, which is unrestrained by politics and bad politics and mm. dictators. Uh, you know, it could be, uh, and I think I've read it somewhere that um, uh, people would. There was fear that people would associate the evil powers with, like, the communist government or something to that yeah. effect. Mm. So, but again, you have to go to the that they would misattribute who was the good guy. Yeah, who that's were the right. Good guys that's who right. The they could yeah. have been. Uh, it could have been seen as the critique or criticism of the Soviet regime. Uh, that would be my guess. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think the book is called uh, Talking Through Russian Eyes. I think so. Okay. I think you're, you must be right. Well, his moral geography, the good people tend to be in the north and the west and the bad people tend to be in the east and the south. So oh, they may have thought the geography contribute. was, it, mm. it looks a little bit like Tolkien's view of uh, Europe. Oh, well, there mm. you go. <laughs> <laughs> How about translations of C.S. Lewis? Have there been problems, controversies about any work done on him? Not that I'm aware of. He's very widely embraced, um, including embraced and published and republished by the Russian Orthodox Church and Alexander Main Foundation and other agencies. Um, He's very well loved in the Christian circles all over. He's a mere Mm. Christian and everybody Mm. accepts him Mm. as such. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, he's, I don't, I, I may not just be aware of maybe any controversies, but uh, there are some translations uh, I know of the Narnia Chronicles, uh, but I think Natalia Trauberg's translation remains the classic and mm. the best, probably. And when were mm. those done? I'm afraid to even say. I would guess uh, 90s, maybe late mm. 80s, early 90s. Mm. Oh, but again, you have to check. Lewis had a friend named Zernoff who was Eastern Orthodox, who he really admired his spirituality. Yeah. I think Dorothy Sayers, Dorothy Sayers did as well. So she had a project that she called the Ecumenical Penguin, where she wanted to get conversations among Eastern Orthodox, especially Russian mm-hmm. Orthodox, because of her friendship with Zernoff, or um, at least her appreciation of his works, Roman Catholic and Protestant. And to say, rather than what is the lowest common denominator, what is the highest common factor mm-hmm. that we all share? Mm-hmm. And the irony is she couldn't get people to agree, oh. even uh, at that basic mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, there are, I know, people who are trying very hard, I think, in your country and in my country to make sure that the conversation never stops. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I am so grateful to uh, everyone who worked on Lewis and produced Lewis and continues to translate Lewis to the... uh, There's a wonderful um, media resource called Predania, which is, you know, the Russian for tradition. And it belongs, I think, loosely to the Russian Orthodox Church. And they feature Chesterton and Lewis and MacDonald and all the other authors, Dorothy Sayers, you know, they're all there, you know, and mm-hmm. they're um, available for Russians to uh, at least look at uh, and to buy or to listen to. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's wonderful that mm. uh, all these authors are available to people. Mm. And uh, what's on your to-do list in terms of all these activities, teaching, translating, uh, writing, uh, being a ambassador for the seven authors really a- around the world? Uh, what do you see as projects that you really... W- and uh, I should mention also Dramatic Producer. We saw a mm. wonderful rendition of The Light Princess uh, <laughs> done by... Were those high school students or college students? Uh, they were mainly high school students, yes. Mm-hmm. So what sorts of uh, things do you have that you're working on right now? Well, uh, I am a full-time teacher at the university with a large workload. So that's what I'm doing for the foreseeable <laughs> future. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it is a lot of work. Uh, mm. It's long hours, many hours, uh, five courses every semester. You know, mm. that's, that's a lot of preparation. And because mm-hmm. I teach freshman English, that's a lot of grading. Mm. 
Yes. Um, so um, this is this takes the bulk of my time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, ideally, ideally, I would really like to translate at least seven more novels by George MacDonald, uh, the two Malcolm novels, uh, the Brother Makarad, you know, the mm. that one. How do you do Scottish dialect? Oh, I love it. Uh, mm. uh, well, it's not very easy to understand uh, sometimes, but even once for you're, English speakers, right. once you get into it, you get you get good. You know, it only is difficult for the first three days or so, and then you get used <laughs> to it. And then uh, friends gave me Scottish English dictionaries and glossaries, and there's this wonderful thing called the internet that you can <laughs> use. Um, so yeah, and we we consciously made a decision to translate from the original. Uh, so I do translate the originals, not the uh, adapted versions or shortened mm-hmm. versions. Mm-hmm. So that's what we do. How many have you translated so far? Well, uh, I have translated Fantastis and Lilith, which are written in English. And then uh, Sir Gibby, Donald Grant and Thomas Wingfold. Mm-hmm. And ideally, I would like to follow up with Paul Faber. Um, and Robert Falconer, uh, and then two Malcolm novels, the What's Mine is Mine novel, and I'm forgetting one more that I, it's like a must. Mm. And then it would be really great to do better translations of the Curdy uh, fairy tale. Right, mm. right. Uh, I also would like to uh, work more on translating uh, Evelyn Underhill, uh, mm. who is a favorite, um, so... That's something that um, is yeah, also C.S. Lewis really um, valued a strong work. desire. And again, Charles Williams's introduction to her letters is just uh, wonderful. And uh, her letters are a precious source of growth for me, and I want to make it available. Mm. Right. So, uh, again, that's the whole desire. You read something, you go, "Wow, this is amazing," and you want to share it. I think it's mm. the teacher in me that wants to do mm. that. Mm-hmm. We wish we could adopt Evelyn Underhill as our eighth weight author. We, mm-hmm. we, she has a lot of fans here in this building. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, there's there's always work. Uh, there's uh, an unfinished musical that is sitting in my table called The Return, and it's uh, three stories put together, sort of woven together, and it's Cain and Abel, Martha and Mary, and the Prodigal Son. Uh, wow. No, so three time. I don't, I don't know, three different times um, uh, because the prodigal son is taken into the 21st century. Uh, mm. And then Martha and Mary, and there's that story in Uncane and Abel, and it's all about the older brother, you know, the younger brother or sister, and uh, the prodigal father, um, mm. or, you know, the father. So in the return is, the big question is, are we going to return? Because we're all, of course, there is the... Um, I think it's Henry Nouwen's thoughts, right? That uh, all of us have the father in us and the son, the younger and the older son. So that's what it's all about. Mm. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. Have you read Dorothy Sayers' The Just Vengeance? Because she makes the same point. She says, we all have Cain and we all have Abel. Mm -hmm. And that that is so true. And that's why it makes, uh, I really... Uh, love Dorothy Sayers the way she writes her plays and all of her plays uh, and because she she really uh, has this amazing scholarly and human approach to each of her characters and when we were working on the musical about uh, Jesus amazingly called the Messiah I borrowed heavily from her Judas and and yeah. I love the way that she helps us see just his logic, uh, yes. because it's it's logical. It's not. I mean, you understand why he did what he yes. did. Uh, and she you, makes him a sympathetic character. You which empathize is with him, and, and that was part of the controversy mm-hmm, of her plays mm-hmm. as well. And as a proud intellectual mm-hmm. myself, I totally relate to mm-hmm, Judah's struggle. Mm-hmm, so that's mm-hmm. why uh, when you are working on a play based, especially on a biblical character, we've done some production like Jonah, Abraham and Sarah, uh, Isaac and Rebecca. Uh, and uh, we did we did one that was really fun called 2012 because everybody was talking about the end of the world. So we decided we're going to mm. talk about Noah's flood. And we had Noah's wife, who doesn't know her name because it's not mentioned in the Bible, right. come to a therapist's office and talk about it. So we had Noah's wife talking to the therapist about her experiences um, in the ark and before the flood and you know in the ark and after. So that was a fun musical to write. But you had to uh, try to understand what was Noah thinking and feeling and what was going on, what compelled him to this, or Abraham and Sarah, what were the struggles, uh, etc. So Judas... Um, 
in our play, my baby brother played Judas. He's an amazing singer. Mm. And you, you really had to be done from the inside. Uh, and it was. And you could see the humanity. And I think our audience was just as shocked as Dorothy Sayers' listeners. Mm. 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 Great idea. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank this you has for been having a me. wonderful conversation and you are doing amazing work. I just think your students are blessed oh, to have you. you. I hope they realize that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> have them listen to this podcast. Right. Go to the very end. Right. <laughs> okay, will do. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this has been so, so much, much fun. <laughs> Great conversation.